80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro-black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pop rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose say what's cracking youtube it's your boy 16 to life and i'm back like i'm on a pro violation yard down <laughs> y'all already know what it is today man we got another interview cracking off man today we got an extremely interesting interview um with an individual who was sentenced to 50 years to life um i believe he called his case around the age of 14 and he was sentenced around the age of 16 and he's been incarcerated ever since but we'll definitely get into that we'll let him tell you more about his situation and his incarceration and he goes by the name of big state big state what's up with you man first and foremost thank you for coming on my platform sharing your story with me and my viewers um so tell us a little bit about yourself homie where, where are you from i'm from sacramento g parkway stars okay and so g parkway stars for those out there who may not be familiar are you guys bloods are you guys crips can you explain a little bit more in detail yeah g parkway we're not bloods or crips we're uh we're not like the traditional gang we're we're the mob we're g parkway mob and then inside that we got the stores so the stores is like a circle within a circle you know like a, a bunch of friends you grew up with a, a clique and so um you say you grew up in sacramento man tell us a little bit about your upbringing how was life for you um growing up well life for me life for me uh you know it's like the, the your, your typical uh child i grew up in a two-parent household to about the age of eight uh at the age of eight my father went to prison for a uh, voluntary manslaughter so from eight on up you know i was in a single parent uh household so you know i went to elementary with my friends we used to uh go around stealing bikes stealing from stores uh still in cars you know i would often get kicked out of uh one school to another you know by the time i went to elementary uh i had attended about four or five schools okay and so did you have uh any siblings any older siblings any younger siblings well yeah i got an older brother and i got a uh i got a little brother then i got uh some half sisters that's just on my dad's side um was your was your older brother was he affiliated to the G with the G Park Stars, and if not, how did you get introduced to the G Park Stars? Well, you know, it's it's, it's really just you know my environment. Everybody that I didn't grew up with in my neighborhood, this this is where we're from. So it's like it's like some of you born into my brother. He's from G Park, where he's not from the store. So it's like, but all my friends that I grew up with, this is like some we didn't grow up in. This is not like some you going to get put on. This is like my mom know his mom, uh, my dad know his dad. You know, we were so close that, you know, when you go to uh, one of your friend's houses, if you did something wrong, his mind will be able to discipline you. Right. Most definitely. And like you say, it it is it is like that in a lot of traditional gangs and, and stuff, especially, you know, back in my era when um, everybody was a close unit, you know. And so you say so. So in order for me to get this correctly, so G Parkway is the name of the area. But then also G Parkway stars is a it's like a. You said a gang within a gang. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's like a gang within a gang. So it's like a clique. It's the stars are a clique in, inside of G Parkway because you said your brother's from G Parkway. Uh, uh, You're from G Parkway stars. Exactly. Oh, okay, okay. And so let me ask you this because you said that um, you you had your father in your life up until the age of eight. Do you believe him? Do you believe him being incarcerated? led to you turning into a criminal lifestyle well i believe it played a part i can't i can't just put the sole responsibility on him because at the end of the day i got to take accountability for my own actions but i did uh believe it played a huge part because i always looked up to my father you know uh, whether he knew it or not i always wanted to be like him and i remember one time when i was young i said man i'm gonna I'm 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 go to prison man and i'm gonna be my dad man i'm gonna be with my dad so 
it was like a motherfucker always learns to uh, want to be around my father. So I believe that plays some type of some type of role in it, but it's not the sole reason. Right. And most definitely now. And of course, you know, answer as little or as much as you are comfortable with answering it and answer nothing if you're not comfortable in answering. But was your most was your father because you said your father ended up going to jail behind a manslaughter? Was your father involved in any type of uh, in any type of capacity in the streets or um, was that just a situation that that was a spontaneous situation? Well, you know, my dad was he was in the streets, you know, he was about his money. But that situation in particular, you know, uh somebody tried to do something to him and he was defending himself um i believe you told me that you had older siblings so do you think your older sibling played a part in you being introduced to the g parkway stars or was that just a natural progression of living in that neighborhood no nah, that, that was more of a natural progression of living in that neighborhood because uh you know me and my brother we close but growing up you know he did his thing and i did my thing he had his own group of fans and i had my own group of fans right and how much so how much older is, is this brother uh, he's about two years older than me okay and so at what age did you find yourself you know becoming more involved in the things that the g parkway stars was doing and more involved in you know things that were criminal i believe probably about maybe the age of 10 to be honest with you because uh like i said it started off from going to run a neighborhood with my friends and stealing bikes to go into the store and stealing candy and things of that nature or uh, going and stealing the uh, uh, gas scooters and then, you know, elevating and stealing g rods, which is a, you know, a stolen car to then breaking their houses and burglarizing. So it was a it was a gradual progression. It wasn't right. something that just happened overnight. It kind of built up. Part of it is, you know, we come from poverty. So it's like when you're walking around and you seeing kids with nice bikes or you seeing kids with nice shoes or you know, you seeing people with other things or you go to somebody's house and they got a nice game. So it was like, man, I want those. So then you start to find ways to get what you don't have. And it's not because uh, that your mama or your father don't want to give it to you. It's just that, you know, they make it enough to, to feed you and keep a house over your head. Right. Most definitely. And I think you brought up a, an extremely important point where, you know, a lot of times I hear that people who have not who have not been involved in this in this type of lifestyle, they often want to blame the parents, you know, and sometimes we just get out there and we make decisions on our own. Our parents cannot watch us 24 hours a day, you know, and recently I did a story on some some rogue police officers in Mississippi who went in, went into a man's house because they it was reported that this guy was living with a white woman and they went in his house. Mm. They they tortured him, um, you know, uh, did a lot of things to him, assaulted him, poured soap and liquor on him, eventually shot him in the mouth, him and his friend. They shot him. And so my, my, my point of saying all this is if these are grown people who are officers of the law and, and they have done these things, are their parents to blame for what they have done? You know, so a lot of times I think it's unfair for people who want to point things and point point these faults to the parents. You know, sometimes we make decisions of our own. And so, um, you said you got arrested at around the age of 14. So when did you when did you looking back on life now? When did you start getting into the things that that would be considered more violent? Well, I say probably about the age of 12, about the age of 12. You know, that's when we started. Uh, well, I started, you know, going around robbing people. Uh, and, and crimes like that, you know, uh, shooting at people and things of that nature. So probably about the around age of 12. Wow. You know, that's extremely young for a person to be out in the street shooting at people. Um, what were you were were the people that you were associated with? Were you guys beefing with other people or what? You know, what what do you believe brought along that dramatic change in your life? Yeah, we was, you know, beefing with a certain group from a certain area and it started off as fist fights. And then, you know, uh, it just kind of like progress. And it's not like uh, it's like ain't something that nobody made me do. It's kind of like something like that. You know, I got to prove myself. It's like I'm hanging around all the other homies. I'm active. And, you know, I got to I got I got to I got to be the one that push along. I got to be the one that, that that's that's out there. And, you know, you you make a lot of good points because coming from that lifestyle myself, man, it's like at some certain time, it's not like we ever made a choice 
to join the game because like you say we grow we grew up with these dudes man and we spend the night at each other's house and their mother you know can can discipline us and their mother are friends with our family and stuff like that and just at some certain point we just find one day we're riding bikes and the next day I mean, we're selling dope excuse me so it's not like we made a, a decision you know it just just one day we start doing stuff you know and so um but man you got caught up at the age of 14 so you you was arrested and eventually you said given 50 years to life so um now that you're older looking back on on that type of stuff what was, what was that like for you well looking back on it man it, it was it was you know coming to jail especially at the age of 14 it's like it's like a living nightmare i remember one of my first visits i go out there i'm behind a the glass of course there's no contact and i'm sitting down and I walk in and my mama walk in and the first thing she do is she start crying. So when she start crying, I start crying. So the first thing she said, she said, baby, she said, I can't help you now. You on your own. I did all I could for you. I can't help you now. These people got you. They got you. She said, baby, so just stay strong. And keep your head up. So, you know, it's like a living nightmare. And it always plays to my mom because at the time, you know, when you out there in the streets, and you causing chaos and you wreaking havoc on the community, you're not thinking that, OK, when I go to jail, that not only am I going to be suffering, but my family going to be suffering. You know, I didn't make my, my, my family a victim to my actions. So that's like something you got to live by. So, you know, growing up, you go through them stages, especially being in jail. And then you also, you know, go through the stages of being angry, being mad at the world. Oh, OK, my friends ain't writing me no more. This female ain't right, you know, so now you start to blame everybody else when really the blame is on you because uh, you chose to do them actions. So, like I say, it, it was a living nightmare, at least uh, I say my first three years. You know, hey, man, first and foremost, hats off to you, right? Because I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you, man. And, you know, you've been locked up since the age of 14. Um, you've been in prison. And I know what that's like. For those of you guys who don't know, he's only been on level fours, man. Level fours are not necessarily conducive to change. They're not necessarily conducive to a person taking accountability for his actions and becoming, you know, just just um, articulate, man. You know, I can definitely tell that you are you are an extremely articulate individual, man. And so, you know, by me being in that lifestyle and and being in those on those four yards, I just congratulate you because, like I said, I know it's, it's a lot of negative things going on, man. And so you you was charged you was charged with murder or attempted murder. What uh, what what was you charged with? No, I was charged with first degree murder, premeditated first degree murder. Wow. And and so. At the age of 14, that's a whole lot, you know, because. I don't care what what anybody says, you know, they like to sometimes charge people who commit crimes like that as adults but there is no way that a person is an adult at that age and actually that's part of the reason now why so many lifers myself included were free from prison because they've done a study and it shows that the brain the, the parts of the brain that's responsible for being uh impulsive having uh remorse um uh, being aware of what what we are really doing is not fully developed until the age of 25. so that played a big part and me being released but anyway with all that being said man at the age of 14 once you're arrested for a murder um what's going through your mind man what's going through my mind i see my attorney uh my first attorney visit so she comes she says uh so mr stevens uh you know why you're in jail uh right i say yeah i know why i'm in jail she says okay so you're facing 25 to life so i'm like all right I ain't really think too much of it. So I go to court. And when I go to court, she says, uh, Mr. Stevens, I told you wrong. She says, you're actually facing 50 years of life. So when she told me that, I'm like, damn, I'm like, man, it, it, it's over. Like, man, what, what I'm going to do? Like, this is how I got to spend the rest of my life. Like, like, damn, like, man, like, I got to be caged up like an animal. Like, man, this, this is how I got to see my mama. So it's like, man, like, I ain't going to be able to see the streets again. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So it was like I say, everything just came crashing down on me. Everything came crashing down on me. I remember that day because uh, when my attorney told me that I had walked back to the to the housing unit. And as soon as I get in the door, I see my friend uh, Wood. And when I see my friend Wood, I just start to start kind of like crying and putting my head down. He like, brother, what's wrong? What's wrong? I'm like, man, and I couldn't I could barely get the words out. He like, man, what's wrong? What, what, what they say? I'm like, man, they told me, man, 
they trying to give me 50 years of life. And he couldn't even say that. He just shook his head like, brother, it's going to be all right. And that's crazy, man. And so I just want to say uh, to anybody that's out there listening, that's in the streets, man, pay attention to this brother. You know, a lot of times we out there, we doing things, me, myself, right? Um, man, I shot at a whole bunch of people. And, you know, uh, I just felt I was never going to get caught. You know, we out there, the more we get away with stuff, I think the more we become feeling like we slick, man. But once you get locked up and like you say, the weight of what we done is placed upon us. It's a different situation, man. Some people handle it different. Everybody, everybody handles things differently. But at the age of 14, <clears throat> I'm assuming you hadn't had nothing in your life but a bicycle. You know, a bi man, you ain't had a car. You ain't had a driver's license. I don't even know if you laid down with a woman was able to take your shoes off and enjoy yourself. So at the, <laughs> at the age of 14, man, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's lightweight funny, but it's, it's not funny, man, because this dude has spent from the age of 14 incarcerated, basically all his teens. So 14, he was only so he was only 13 one year, of course. For all his 14s, all his 20s. Now, what you say, you 32 or 37? Now, 30. Now, 32. I'm going into my, my 30s. Now, I'm 32. And yeah, so I mean, and I understand, of course, you know, there was a victim here. There was somebody who lost his life. And, you know, um, I'm sure that person would rather be in your position than be deceased and all that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, this is the end result of a street lifestyle. It doesn't turn out good for anybody, man. And so, you know, um, as you continue to go through this court process and you dealing with all this stuff, are you feeling that you have a chance or, or, you know, because like I say, people in their mind sometimes as, as being locked up, I've seen people who was dead bang and they thought, Oh, they was going to beat the case. Everybody handles, everybody handles trauma differently. So how did you view your situation? Did you think you was getting out or did you think it was over? Well, no, nah, I, I thought I was getting out, man, because uh, really like, if you look at my case, it was it was it was kind of like self defense. You know, I had gotten that I I had gotten a fight. God had to snake me, and one thing led to another, and my crime happened. So I thought I was getting out, and then my attorney came right before I went to trial and said, "Hey, man, uh, the district attorney, you know, she, they wanted to give you a deal. What would you be willing to take?" So I said, "Okay, I'd be willing to take ten to seventeen years." So my attorney, she said, "Nah, I think I'm gonna try to get you lower than that." She said, "I'm gonna try to get you six years for a manslaughter." So it gave me hope. So then the next time I seen her, she came back. She said, man, the DA is offering you a deal for 25 to life. I'm like, 25 to life? I'm like, man, I might as well take it to trial. You know, at the time, I'm only 16. So 25 to life, that, I'm like, man, that's the, the rest of my life in prison. Right. I'm like, man, I might as well just take it to trial and, 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 and see how I'm going to come out. Right. So I ended up taking it to trial. And then so, you know, you said something that was very important, or at least I felt it was important. You said, you know, once you get locked up, you know, you said that you get a better picture of 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 what life is really like. Homie, stop writing, you know, certain females stop writing. Life goes on. How did that? So how did that affect you? You know, feeling that you was abandoned by your homies. You was abandoned by people who you thought cared for you. What was that like? Well, at first, you know, going through the early stages of my incarceration, it, it was real bitter. It's like, man, when I get out, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, or, you know, I'm going to do this to that person, or I'm going to do this to that person, because, you know, you're not at that self-realization yet. You're not at that awareness yet. You're not at that that conscious mind that, you know, it's not their fault. You know, although we as homies, and, and we did feel like we had a certain obligation to everybody, at the end of the day, it was my choice. So it's like I was real bitter, you know. Uh, I felt like the, the world owed me something. I feel like everybody owed me some. I feel like, you know, uh, 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 forget everybody. Like, man, these ain't my homies. But then as time goes on, you like, you know what, man, this is a choice that I made. You know, this is is, is what I was doing. And my my actions led to these results. So, you know, you know, at, at the end of the day, you look at it like, man, I can't cry about the, the, the bed I laid for myself. Right. And, and, and so you eventually uh, go to trial. You found guilty. Um, they give you 50 years of life. So what was that like, man, when you sitting in there on your sentencing day and you hear the judge say 50 to life? Man, it's like I didn't even really hear him. It's like I just my mind went blank. It's like my, my mind was in a fog. It's like he said it. I heard it, but I didn't hear it. Next thing I know, the bailiffs, they come in, they cuff me up, they shackle me, they walk me out. I'm looking back. 
my mom looked like she want to cry, but she don't want to let these people see her cry. And the whole time on the walk, I'm like, man, it's over. It's over. This 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 the rest of my life. I ain't gonna get out till I'm 65, 60, 60 years old. Right. And you know that's that's something that I was gonna ask you about if your mom was present, but you said yes. And you know that's another thing that you said that was extremely important, and and let me know that you have definitely um educated yourself, man, and took accountability for your actions. When you mentioned the pain that we place on our family members, you know, our parents, you know, our loved ones, our brothers and sisters, you know, they don't want to see us incarcerated. But at the same time, like your mom said, there's very little that they can do for us, maybe with the exception of trying to help us financially, you know, because once we put ourselves in a position to basically give our lives over to the enforcement, law enforcement and in, in, in the prison system, it's pretty much nothing they can do. Um, and that's something that I think everybody needs to take into account. We all have people who care for us and, you know, hurting our parents and our and our loved ones is. It's part of what we do when we sign up for this lifestyle. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So, um, you're 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 16 years old once you're convicted, and then you're sent to a, I'm assuming a California Youth Authority, which is basically for those who don't know, it's a it's basically like a prison for juveniles and any anywhere from the ages I believe of like 14 to 25, right? Yeah, yeah, you're correct. 14 to 25. And so, what was life like when you got there? Now, and, and keep in mind, like I said, y'all, it's it's for the ages of people who have who are between 14 and 25. A lot of these people have a gang, a gang mindset. So of course I'm sure that there's no there's no positivity going on. You know, what was it like being in? Because I've never been to youth authority. What was it like being in there? Well, see, the Cali California Youth Authority, it's a it's a gang. So when you go in there, uh they got in there what they call the uh the residence. So it's basically like the Mac rip. So you see, you go in there, Mac rips sits you down. Hey man, you know you got homies from over. You got homies here. They on this uh building, they in this building, they in this building, and then they give you a list of words you can and can't say. So like say for instance, uh, starburst. You can't say starburst because if you say starburst, now you got to catch a, a fade with somebody that's from Bakersfield stroller board, stroller boards because you need this they said. So now you can enter it into basically a, a, a game. So I get there. I'm probably there about two weeks. I end up going to the hole. We end up packing out uh, one of my enemies. So now I'm in a hole. So now when I'm in a hole, the, uh, the, they got the gang crisis counselor. He comes talks to me. Hey, man, you know, you're going to be in a hole until uh, you get ready to hit the main line and we lodge you on the building. So I go to the hole. We come back. I come back to the main line. As soon as I get to the main line, now it's like, okay. Now you got to catch phase with all your enemies that's on the main line, just mandatory. That's just something you got to do. So in YA, you know, you basically just fighting all the time. You fighting, we smoking, and we working out and hitting the weights. That sounds crazy to me, right? So you say you get there, some of your homies approach you, and they basically give you a list of words that you can't say because these words are disrespectful to other gangs. And so we don't necessarily have to go into what exactly the words were, but about how many words was on the list? Man, about as many as you could think. Graham right. crackers. Uh, uh, it's, it's a gang of things you can't say, like things you wouldn't even think about. Like, man, who the hell just came up with some shit like this? Like, what? How, how did you even get this as disrespect? How did you even take that as disrespect? Like, man, if you don't stop playing with me. And it's funny that you that you mentioned that, right? Because I don't know, maybe a, a week or two ago, I did a story talking about something similar to this, where, you know, you have to be careful of what you say in this California gang life, a simple word, because it's, you know, it's um, a lot of these simple words, like you say, that a person wouldn't even realize is disrespectful to another person's gang. And so, you know, yeah, that's crazy, you know, living that life in prison um, or California Youth Authority, where you have a lot of like minded people, it doesn't it doesn't do much for the development of of education you know it 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 pretty much reinforces and strengthens the negative mind style that we have being a gang member so how did you know being in youth authority catching these phase and all that stuff i'm assuming so it just made you become stronger in, in your gang beliefs right exactly it just it, it just made everything worse because now it's like okay this is what you got to do in jail. So now with this mindset, it's like, okay, as soon as I get to prison, I'm going to have to do the same thing. So you keep the same behavior and belief system up because it's something that you're building on. You know, like they say, 
when you do positive things, positive results got to follow us. It's, it's the same thing with negativity. When you keep doing negative things, it builds a negative character. And so while you're in this California Youth Authority, is it just a lot of fades or are people also making weapons and, and having knives? Man, people, people are or 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 using socks and soaps, locks and soap. I mean, locks and socks, soaps and socks. Uh, anything that uh, a person can get his hands on it to hurt you. I remember one time we had a, 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 a ride with the Mexicans over the microwave. And and so during this riot, was this riot with the northern Mexicans or the southern Mexicans? Or no, this one was with the with with the southern Mexicans. Had a ride with them over the microwave. A brother got up. He threw a fuck. A fuck is basically on my dead homies. Nobody better use his uh, microwave but the blacks. So a southerner, he gets up. He touches the microwave. As soon as he touches the microwave, the brother takes off on him. It's a full ride after that. And if you can remember, why was the brother upset? Why didn't he want no? Why didn't he want only blacks to use the microwave? Well, really, it was a never thing on this lodge, on this building. It was more blacks than Mexicans. So he like, well, we just going to run the building. Oh. It was a, a ego and a pride thing. You know, young, we young and he's letting his ego and his pride get to him. Right. And that's what I was going to say. Just being young and immature. And unfortunately, as I said earlier, that's what goes on a lot of times in these prisons and these youth authorities where you don't have any 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 maturity it's just a lot of immature stuff going on and it's perpetuated when one person sees another person do an immature act a lot of times people will believe okay this is the way that i have to act and it just really it's a horrible situation and so once you stayed in there two years and you were sent to prison what was your mindset like had you heard a lot about going to prison what what did you believe you had to do once you got to prison well i know i'm like in my mind i'm thinking okay once i get to prison I'm going to have to set a demonstration just so that nobody mess with me. That was my mindset. When I get to prison, I'm setting a demonstration. I'm setting an example. And so you're, you're pretty much saying that you felt that once you got to prison, you was going to have to perpetrate some type of act of violence to let everybody know that you wasn't the one to be toyed with. Exactly. That was exactly my mindset. And so when you, when you left the California Youth Authority and you were sent to your first prison, what prison did they send you to? Well, I left the California Youth Authority on my 18th birthday. So at the age of 18, they sent me to Higher Desert State Prison Level 4, 180 Super Maximum Security. Okay. And so in the course of me doing my YouTube page and interviewing a lot of people, um, even though Pelican Bay has a very vicious reputation by name, I've heard a lot of people say that actually High Desert is the worst prison in terms of violence and things of that nature um what was it like for you getting there did you were, were you and, and let me ask you um because i normally do this um uh, are you what's your what's your you know are you are you tall are you a short dude uh what's your you know how, how much do you well, say I'm about, I'm about an average shot i'm about five ten five eleven right because and a lot of times people wonder why i do that you know but um in this gang life, a lot of times we size people up by size. You know, uh, if you happen to go to prison and you're an extremely bigger dude and you carry yourself right, you may not have a whole lot of encounters. If you are a smaller dude, sometimes even though you may carry yourself in a, in a manner that's considered righteous, you may have some people test you just because you're smaller and they think that they can take advantage of you. So um, that's why I asked that question. So when you first got there at, at a fresh 18, were you embraced and by some people of your from your from your uh uh from your area and you know what was there what was there how was they trying to lace you and, and tell you how to do time well luckily for me when i when i first came to uh prison when i got to hard desert i ended up being in the cell with one of my og homies from metaview so right off the back it was all love and plus i knew his son so as soon as i got there uh matter of fact the southerners and the northerners was at war so we was on lockdown so He's giving me the ins and outs. You know, you do this, you don't do that. You know, when you go to the yards, you always walk with somebody to keep security on you. Uh, you know, always pay attention to your surroundings. Uh, when you go to the yard and you work out, don't do push-ups on the yard because, you know, you don't never want to let nobody catch you while you're down. So he was giving me, you know, basic survival skills of, of the prison life, you know, and then he started handing me books to read. 
while I was on lockdown. You know what, youngsters, don't watch TV so much. Expand your mind. Learn more. Right. And sorry, um, sorry, I was coughing when you said that your OG was basically telling you, he said, don't do push-ups, or you said burpees? Yeah, yeah, he told me, don't, when you know, when you go to the yard, basically, the workouts you can do in a cell, push-ups, burpees, uh, sit-ups, things of that nature, don't do that on the yard, because you don't never want to be caught with your head down on the ground on the yard, because anything might happen. So always do your do your workouts like that in the cell. And then when you go to the yard, you know, do the pull ups, the dips and run last and things of that nature. Right. And once again, man, for those who, of course, who've never been to present prison prison, this youngster right here, this brother right here, he was extremely fortunate to be locked up with somebody that was from his town. And then he had a relationship with the dude's son because having the schooling from a older person who knows how to navigate his way through prison is extremely important in any prison, but especially a level four 180 when, you know, a certain mistake could cost a person his life.